Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over this weekend's UFC card. And we're doing it from a DFS perspective in this video. And for those of you that uh, did not know, I mean, last week, obviously, we completely crushed it. Um, you know, it doesn't usually work out that way, but uh, pretty much all of our takes came through. All of our fades faded, and we took down the, the big GPP on DraftKings. I've got first and second tied for both first and second total cast for about 85,000. And what we did was we basically just leveraged all of our top plays, you know, Yagos and, and Silva and high stand. And uh, we were basically locked up uh, before the main event even started. We were, it didn't matter who won. Uh, well, I mean, it mattered in terms of money. If, if blades smashed, uh, we would have, uh, duped uh, we would have chopped with five people or four others the way it worked out with surge winning we ended up chopping with one other person and if by totally busted we would have won it by ourselves but there was no way it was going to bust uh it needed to come in less than 80 points for the winner to bust and that was just never going to happen so overall just uh, amazing amazing uh amazing i would say luck but yeah variance was on our side we got a nice little uh no contest uh in our favor in a fight that we faded and uh, yeah, moving on to the next one. So this weekend's DFS slate is, it's, it's, this is one of the things that, that makes things interesting for me. It's, it's such a, a different slate and they're all different, but this is completely different. So it's funny. Last week, again, we were able to identify some key fights and some, some good underdogs because all the big favorites were just really hopeless with respect to their various, uh, you know, uh, internals like, like uh, going back, it was, uh, it was a Bobby Green, 9,300 hopeless, which was, you know, it didn't have to work out that way, but it looked hopeless to us. Francis Marshall, hopeless. Um, there was another 9,400, which we thought was just a terrible play. So it was, there was no need to get up to those big favorites. So we could, we could play those, um, what's the name, Wells in the mid range, like really, really heavy, and we could play those underdogs. And you didn't really need to get up to those 92, 9,300s. Um, but this week, as we'll, you'll see, there are several uh, fighters over 9K who you really would love to get to. Um, and throughout, you know, 75% of the week, I, I thought it was going to be a really, really impossible card because quite honestly, I, the underdogs didn't look that great. And you wanted to get to these big favorites. So I didn't know exactly what we were gonna, I was going to do. I was, I was coming up with ideas in my head of, trying to pick the best loser or something like that. Just because again, it, it was just one of those, one of those cards. And then kind of like a gift from God. Well, we shouldn't say this, but you never know what will happen. But from a gift from God, the slate completely opened up, uh, giving us actually two uh, just basically free squares to, um, uh, to make this whole thing work. Uh, I was looking for underdogs to play, and one just kind of just popped out of thin air, honestly. And we'll talk about that. And let, actually, let's talk about that right now. So, so originally what we had on the card is we had Brian Kelleher against Johnny Newsom. And if you look at the um, at the pricing, it was correct. You had Kelleher was about, if you go back to it, Kelleher was a uh, – like it was about a minus 140 favorite, something like that. And he was priced at 8,900 and Journey Newsom was priced at 7,300. You could have actually made the case that Newsom had a little bit of line value at 7,300 because he was really, you know, money was coming in on him a little bit. He was only a, kind of a plus 140. Um, but then what happened was, is that Pelleher dropped out. So, um, what ended up happening then is that they can't change the price on Newsom, and they were they didn't drop the fight. They replaced him uh, Kelleher with a replacement, that being McGee, uh, first name Marcus. And what happens is you results can't change ten, four, five, two, eight official results. Worse than going on. Um, so you couldn't. They couldn't change the price tags. So what you're left with is this new fight that ran the risk of creating an inefficient pricing model. That's exactly what happened. So you'll look and you'll see Marcus McGee or Journey Newsom is now, he's like a minus one, 
even accounting for VIG, like minus 170. So he really should be about 8,900 himself, but he is being priced at um, 70. He's still priced at 7,300. So he is basically a theoretical lock at 7,300. Um, the, the, the only thing that could have, you know, you could have argued against him in this spot is either, you know, that his ceiling might not be as high as some others at the 7,400 range. We'll talk about that. But you could also could have argued that, you know, ownership was going to come in just too high. Uh, one thing I will say, by the way, about that is that I've been doing this for a little while now. And, and when these theoretical locks come up mathematically, I promise you they're under owned every single time. Uh, every time I feel as though these things should be 100% owned or 90, uh, they end up like 30 or something like that. And for, I guess people just want to try to be difficult. You know what I mean? Like you can be difficult when there's a range of outcomes issues, but when there's a complete line of efficiency like that, um, you, you really don't want to fade that, okay? Now, uh, so again, we're gonna take a look and see if the inside the distance prop is that poor. But the thing is, the thing is here is that they also, I think sort of mispriced McGee, you know? So if he's 7,200, He's only like a plus 170. I guess that's sort of fair, you know, but but the thing is, is that if you didn't have it in you to go like full on Newsom, you know, if he doesn't win, like if McGee wins, I mean, 7,200 to bank a $7,200 winner is really important on, on, a, on a card where you want to get to those big favorites, okay? So I, I think that there's no universe where you fade this fight. I think that you play one or the other, and then you just kind of move on with your business. Um, and I know people want to get different. And yeah, you do want to get different, but this is not the fight to do it, in, at least in my opinion. Uh, so let's take a look, by the way, at the inside the distance prop, just, just for the hell of it. So from the, the Newsom uh, perspective, He's like plus 200 inside the distance. So plus 200 inside the distance is actually a really good line if you're like 81, 8200. And we'll talk about that. That's typically what you want for an 8100, 8200 hour fighter. And he's 7200. So even from an inside the distance prop perspective, he's an extremely strong player given his price tag. So, uh, McGee is actually not that bad either. He's about a plus 300 inside the distance, which is probably normal what you want from a 7,300-hour fighter. But given the fact that he's going to get incredible leverage off of what I imagine is going to be a really popular Newsom play, makes makes that you know plus 300 look even better. So I think that right off the bat, you are going to want to play one of these two in every lineup. Um. And because of that, you are going to have plenty of room to get up to these 9,200s, I believe. So that's kind of the first thing. So, I mean, that's that's the first thing I would advise is you played one of these two guys in every one of your lineups. And the fact is, is that, you know, one of them is winning. You know, and unless the fight just completely busts, you know what I mean? Like, you're going to want this. So, you know, uh, if this were a 15 fight card where you could, you know, get 14 shots at underdogs to outscore these dudes, um, think that this is uh, what you need to do. Um, all right, uh, moving on, you have, let's just to start up from the bottom, uh, North versus Haley Cowan. This fight is, is definitely atrocious from a DraftKings perspective. Um, you have... No line value. Uh, well, hold on. So Jamie Lee North is about a 130 favorite or so. And she's being priced at, uh, okay, maybe a tiny bit of line value on North, but not much. I would say that I, it feels as though that the majority of the upside is with North because she, again, the, 
the tape is very, very rare on her, but but she does have some grappling. So you do want to give her a little bit of grappling upside. But aside from that, we're looking at the inside of the distance here and, and neither fighter looks really good. You know, North is plus, or Horth plus 300 inside the distance. Cowan is plus 750 or something like that. So this is just not a fight you want to target. It just isn't. If anything, you play the North side, uh, the, 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 is it Horth? Yeah, the Horth side. Aside from that, not really. So we're moving up, and so here we go. This is the first of the of the of the really really good looking ninety four hundred dollar fighters. You know, you have you have Stephanie Egger. Now, now again, let's take a look at this. So Egger is ninety four hundred. So what you need for a ninety four hundred dollar fighter, right, is is one of a couple of things. Well, first of all, what you'd like is in a vacuum for the fighter to have a minus one ten or better inside the distance prop plus plus a grappling control time kind of extra stuff upside, either knock, knock down upside maybe, but usually you want to pair a minus 110 or better inside the distance prop with a, uh, you know, a grappling approach. And that's, that's pretty much or close to what you're getting from Egger, right? So you look at Egger's inside the distance prop here, it's, you know, not as the greatest, but it's not the worst. It's she's plus 160. But the thing is that the plus 160 is going to be accompanied by takedowns, grappling, and stuff like that. Okay, so I think that overall, I think she's a good play. She's not like she's she's is she a great play? It doesn't matter because there's going to be like three or four plays almost identical to her. So she's in play, and when we get to the other ones, you're just going to probably have to shuffle these because. Who, who am I to say that Edgar is going to be the one to get the first round KO with all the ground impact? You know, and we'll get to the other fighters that are like this in a second. But Edgar is completely in play, huge win odds, perfect path to victory and all this stuff. So you, you, you want a player. And, and the other thing, the other thing that you need or you could use instead of an inside the distance prop or but along with a good inside the distance prop and, and grappling is the ability to get her in. You know what I mean? Um and with this, you know, value that opened up at 7,200, it makes it a lot easier to get her in. So you could give her a little bit of a break with respect to the fact that maybe she doesn't have exactly a minus 110 inside the distance prop. But I do think that all of her, I mean, all of her wins, in addition to whatever inside the distance thing she has, is also accompanied by grappling upside. Um, so I think she's an extremely strong. All right, Cody Durden versus Charles Johnson. All right, so this was going to be the guy that you kind of had to play, right? Um, Charles Johnson's a minus 140 favorite, so he's about typically about 125. So he should be about 8,300, 8,400, and he's kind of overpriced at 87. You're getting some line value in Cody Durden, and what you also with Cody Durden – you get a perfect path to victory situation. So he is a pure wrestler. Well, I shouldn't say that. He does have, he could strike, but if he got into a full striking match with Charles Johnson, it would really be just, just next level bad, you know, ring IQ. So he just almost always going to go for all these takedowns. And Charles Johnson's takedown defense is fine, but but this is just his path to victory, dirt. And so, you know, it, it's a perfect DraftKings underdog. And the funny thing is, is when I was first looking at this, I would have played him even thinking he could lose, you know, because again, I was looking for any type of underdog that even in a loss could get 30, 40 points, which he certainly can. And be prepared for that, by the way. If you play Durden, Durden he could get you a bunch of takedowns and have some control time and still lose because there is sort of this bias against these wrestlers that don't finish their opponent. So don't be surprised if he gets us some takedowns and you think that just because he's doing well from a DraftKings perspective that the judge is going to give him the win, you might end up with a 40-point performance or you know, 50, even a 50-point performance that doesn't get the win to get you to 80, but that actually might have been good enough. Don't think it is anymore, though. You know, I think that you need to get that win now out of him um, to make this work. But yet still, there's no denying that he's a strong play. So um uh, so Durden is, is another very, very strong underdog. Um, Charles Johnson, I, I just I just don't think we can do, right? Because for 8,700, you need at least a, a 
are reasonable inside the distance prop in the absence of any uh, wrestling upside, which he has none. So you look at his inside the distance prop and his Johnson inside the distance is plus like 300. I mean, that's, that's an atrocity. I mean, it's atrocity, whatever. It's just, it's just math, right? But it's, it's what you, sh it's what you're looking for, for a $7,300 fighter, not an 8,900. So he's kind of a stone thing. I mean, listen, if you want to make the case that for ownership purposes, maybe get lucky, get that first round KO. Okay. That's fine. But, but as far as just an actual play, it's just, it's just not good. So dirt is certainly the play from this, from this up. All right. Jake Collier versus Martin Budai. So it's a, basically a straight pick em, and it's being priced as such, almost a straight pick em. So again, what you're looking for here is about a plus 250 ish from these dudes, you know, uh, as far as what type of inside the distance prop you're looking for. Now, again, you, you usually like to play these mid range fights because it opens up value. Um, but again, because these 9Ks are so strong and because you have these 7200s that you can just play at, you know, at will, um, maybe you don't need to go here. But let's just take a look. Like if you have both these guys that have inside the distance props, it's like, like plus 180 or something or 170, you're going to have to play it. But let's see. So Budai inside the distance. Let's look at both of them. Budai is plus 230, which is fine. You know what I mean? And, and that's, it's good. You know, it's good enough. I mean, I would certainly put him in play. Uh, he's going to get a, probably a, you know, healthy amount of exposure in my 150. And I might actually get to him depending how lineup construction plays out um, in my bigger buy-ins. Um, Mollier has much worse of an inside the distance prop. What I struggle with is whether he's the one with the wrestling upside as opposed to Budai. Like Collier does, can do that, just really doesn't all that often. I mean, he was beating on Chris Barnett, and then he just kind of like slipped and got put on his back, and then the guy went full on, full on Donkey Kong on, if you want to know the truth. Um, so uh, probably we'll get to Collier in like MME. Don't think I'll do it in in the bigger buy-ins, but overall this fight's you know decent. You know, not not in must target, but yeah, I think it's totally okay to play, the, especially the Boudets. All right, uh, Josh Quinlan versus Trey Waters. All right, this is going to be one that people pound. I think it was going to be before the value opened up. Maybe people don't go mid range, but I mean we'll take a look at it. So the th the, th the real narrative on this in this fight is that Trey Waters took this fight on a week's notice, which is a little, I mean, that's always, always tough. And Quinlan does have like some decent KOs. Um, so he's dangerous. So take a fight like that on a week's notice is kind of difficult. And, but then on the other hand, you look at, you, you when you look at him like Trey Waters, he's like, he's like, he's like eight feet tall, you know, with like a 4 million foot reach, you know, he looks it's kind of like funny to look at given like they're, they're the same weight. But Trey Warner is going to be like 100 feet taller than him, right? And so uh, it's an interesting fight, I guess. So let's just kind of break it down from a from a you know math perspective. So Quinlan has a minus 185, actually, with Biggs, probably minus 160. So I imagine he's like 8,800 8, or something like that. Let's take a look. It's actually only 8,500. Pretty good line value. Um, and at 8,500, what you're going to want is an inside the distance prop of about – Mm, plus 170 maybe plus 160 plus 150 would be nice uh to make him you know playable in a vacuum let's take a look Quinlan by inside the distance is wow um boy oh boy like almost a pick him maybe even more than a pick -em. this is kind of nuts this is sort of a lock you know what I mean? Like, this is what you're looking for for minus for for ninety two hundred dollar fighters, ninety one hundred dollar fighters. You're getting, I mean, now in fairness, this, this line is not exactly tight. You know, you have a forty cent vig, and it's only coming from one place. You don't know what the limits are, but you have this one at minus one forty. So, I, it's just kind of tough to fade this, right? And on the other hand, you have Waters inside a distance is plus three hundred. I mean, that's what you need for like seventy two, seventy three hundred. Not quite the you know it's not quite good enough for 77 okay? 
Uh, the only thing I will say is that Quinlan is, I would imagine, going to be really popular because of this. So if you want to take a shot at Waters, that's listen, it's very, very, I don't say speculative, but it's very fundamentally weak, right? The guy's got a, coming off a one-week uh, short notice. And these guys usually don't win. Um, but it's not as if he's being priced at like minus plus 400. I mean, he's probably got to have something. You know, he's got a good record. He's got some KOs. But from what I heard, I mean, his last fight, he got KO after he was losing. So this could be a, this could be one to just eat the chalk here. And I, he's just, this Quinlan has got to be mega chalk. He just has to be, right? Um, so, okay. So Quinlan, obviously, so far, with the exception of Newsom, Quinlan is for now the best play on this. Um, all right. So moving on up the card, so to speak. We have uh, Rogerio Delimio, uh, Marcus Rogerio against Waldo Cortez Acosta. So you have Rogerio is about a minus 160 ish. So again, if you want the probably supposed to be the same price as Quinlan and Trey Waters. And uh, yeah, that's what you're getting, you know. So maybe there's a little bit of line value in Delima, I guess. Not quite as good as Quinlan, but yeah, I guess it's fair enough. And the thing is, 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 Here's another guy that we're going to be able to X out in a second, that being his opponent. Uh, we'll get to this. So, at again, plus, minus 160, you want to be nice to have a plus 170 or 160 or something like that inside the distance prop. And he is Rogerio inside the distance is plus 140. That's fair enough. Is it a good as good a play as Quinlan Helmer? But it's in the ball game. You know, I'm not, I'm not. You know, not going to say this is a bad play. I mean, plus 140 is very, for inside the distance prop here, it's very reasonable. Um, so he's, I think he's in play for sure. But Acosta inside the distance, he's a plus 300. Again, that's not what we look for in this price tag, right? That's what we look for in like 72, 7,300 guys. So, and this was my issue, right? Like all these underdogs just look kind of, kind of weak, you know? So, Definitely think that the lead is in play, and I don't think Acosta is going to get my money. All right. Uh, moving on, we have Julian Arosa versus Fernando Padilla. All right, this one's going to be a fun one. You have Arosa is a minus one. What does this look like? 125-ish with Vig. So I expect he should be about 80, I don't know, 8,300. Something like that, maybe 8,400. He's 8,800. So that is nasty. Okay, that is that is some poor line value on Arosa. This is some line value on Padilla. So this is this is a very interesting situation because on the one hand, yes, what I just said, you have good line value on Padilla and you have pretty poor line value on Arosa. But when you get into the internals, you have to, you know, it begs the question, does the line value matter? Not that it doesn't matter, but it is not swamped by other considerations. Those being, uh, first, let's look at the inside and distance prop. You have Arosa inside the distance is plus 200. I guess that in and of itself is actually pretty poor for 8,900, right? Is that what he's actually 8,900? 8,800? So that in and of itself is pretty poor. Um, but the thing is, is that from what, you know, has been going, the scuttlebutt is that Padilla has next level atrocious takedown defense, right? So if, if Arosa decides to go for takedowns, which he's certainly able to do, the, 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 the condition is there for a very big, DraftKings score, even in the absence of a finish. Um, so this is something that's kind of like hidden as value uh, that's kind of masked by a poor inside the distance line. So I would, I would not inside the distance line, by a poor, well, one inside the distance line, but more to the point, uh, money line. So I'm going to get him in, you know, for sure. Now, with respect to Padilla, there's no disputing this, 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 this money line, right? So Let's look at him inside the distance. Plus 200. I mean, let's go. I mean, plus 200 at, at 7,400. 
I mean, we'll, we'll do that. So this like just has become kind of a, a key fight, you know, and I really haven't identified any real key fights yet, you know, with the exception of this of this cheapo. So I think that the Padilla or Rosa fight is the key fight, meaning you want to make sure you get both sides. The Newsom McGee fight, you want to make sure you get both sides. And this is what we did last week, right? Um, Newsom McGee, and I think Padilla or Rosa, and this is tricky. This is sneaky because I don't think, I was about to say, I don't think a Rosa gets owned that high. Just because, again, like the optimizers and the projection models, they, 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 they factor in this line value. They don't always do the greatest job factoring in takedown upside. It's just kind of hard to predict. Um, so, yeah, I think both of these fighters are, are very, very strong fights. Okay, moving on. Uh, just a few more, actually, right? Uh, so we have Rodolfo Vieira versus Cody Brundage. So we have a full minus 200 favorite. So you're expecting to see like 9,100 or so, something like that. We'll take a look. And that's exactly what we have, 9,100, 7,100. Fair enough. Um, so for a $9,100 fighter, again, what we'd like to see is either uh, minus 110 inside the distance um, or um, close to that with significant takedown and grappling upside. So we could split hairs here a little bit. All right, because while maybe Rogerio is not a wrestler per se, he is a good grappler. So the grappler part of him could probably get some control time. Um, it's not really a takedown, not uh, Rogerio, sorry, um, uh, Vieira. So let's let's look first look at the inside the distance prop. All right, inside the distance, uh, Vieira by submission. Vieira by submission is by alone is minus 110. Inside the distance, minus 130. All right, so this is a smash, right? So this is a great play. Um, and this is one of the Stephanie Egger conjurers. You know what I mean? So there's Stephanie Egger and there's Rodolfo Vieira. I consider this kind of like the same play. Okay? I cannot distinguish between the two of them. Yes, if you told me one was going to be higher on the other, I would say fine, play the lower on one. But I can't imagine one of these going to be that much higher on the other because they are almost exactly the same. Uh, the, the only thing that's different, really, is that Vieira doesn't exactly have the same win odds as, as Edgar. You know, Edgar is definitely the safer of the plays. Um, Vieira is like only kind of like, you know, minus 220 with big. But uh, the inside the distance prop speaks volumes, and I think that makes him on par with Edgar. Um, so let's take a look at the Brundage side. So again, you don't need much at 7,100. So if I can get like a plus 300 inside the distance prop on Brundage, I'll, I'll grab it. Okay, so you don't quite have it. You have Brundage, Brundage plus 350. However, and this is kind of kind of funny, Brundage does have takedown upside. Okay, so even though Vieira is more of the submission guy, Brundage, you could argue, or people that know the sport, you know, better than me, could argue that Brundage is actually could be the better wrestler. And it's weird because because even though he is probably the better wrestler, and even though he probably could get takedowns, the the idea is that he probably shouldn't, because if he does go for takedowns, he might end up getting submitted as a result. Um, however, it is a path, right? You know, you get a couple of takedowns, and then you can be then you win on the feet somehow. I think that's very very reasonable. So I am going to actually include him in my uh, what you call it. I'm going to include him in my uh, in my good underdogs here. The um, what's the uh, the Cody Brundage. So is this completely a key fight where I have to take one or the other? Mm, interesting. I do think there are paths where Vieira wins and busts, sort of. Um, I don't think there are many paths where Brundage wins and busts. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think this could be considered a key fight. 
All right, so the last, ne next one, uh, <laughs> basically a, a same, the same fight. Not exactly, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, Shao Barajo versus uh, Mikhail Olozechek. So Barajo is minus 4 million, uh, you know, minus 340, whatever it is. And his price should be, you know, 93, 9400, and he is. Price 9500. And so what you need in 9500 is a combination, like we talked about with Edgar, is a strong inside the distance prop and significantly grappling, grappling up strong. So this is kind of weird because we first look at the inside the distance prop. And you have Barajo is exactly what you want. Barajo inside the distance minus 115-ish. Perfect. But not only that, he also does have the rest. Okay. He's going to take the dude down in all of his, in his wins. And if in fact he submits him as well, which is this part of this minus 110, that's what you need. Now, is he necessarily going to outscore Egger? I don't know. Is he going to outscore DeLima? I, I don't know. But he's definitely a good play. So you probably want to get, you know, something of like all three of those guys. Not all three together. That's very difficult to do. Um, wow, it's actually not that difficult to do. I don't know. We'll, 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 you know, we'll try to do that in a second. But uh, Barajo is right there with, with Egger and uh, what's his name? And with uh, and with Vieira. I think they're both, all three of those are very, very, very like plays, you know, uh, they're inside the distance prop good, wrestling upside good, all good. Uh, Ola Zaychuk, I mean, inside the distance prop at this price, you don't need that much. That's the thing. He's 6,600, 6,700. So you need to have about plus 350, maybe. Let's just take a look. Uh, Ola Zaychek inside the distance is just can't quite get there. So that's just not going to work. All right. So it's just going to be Barajo, I guess, or nothing there. I was hoping to get another underdog, maybe Ola Zaychuk, but I, I just don't, don't see it. And then we get to the main event, uh, which – so the, 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 the idea with the main event has changed, uh, sort of. It, what has not changed is that's an extremely strong fight to target. Right. Uh, you have uh, Simone versus Sonia Dong. It's about a pick em. Uh Give or take a little bit. All the money's come in on Sonia Dong, by the way. And you're actually getting a little tiny sliver of line value in, in Sonia Dong, but that's more than made up to the fact in, in that Ricky Simone's win condition is, is, is probably predicated on getting a bunch of takedowns, which is obviously really, really strong for DraftKings. So at the beginning of the week, before this other $7,300 value opened up, I would say that this main event was a must target. But but given the fact that the um that there, you know, it's gonna be high owned, and that there are other ways to 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 get there due to this new value, um, I don't think you have to play it. Okay. I definitely think it's a strong, strong fight. Okay. And I would include it in that 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 pile of strong fights okay but i don't think you have to have a hundred percent of it okay i think it's in a weird way you almost have to, it's more important to have a hundred percent of the mcgee uh of the mcgee fight than it is to have the main because you get the to have a hundred percent of the mcgee fight that gets you these 9300s you know and to think that none of them are going to get there is very 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 risky to come up with that so I definitely like both sides of this. I don't really have an opinion on which one I like the most. Actually, that's not true. I mean, Simone's just got to be the best. He's got he's with the wrestling upside over five rounds. I mean, that's just you know that he can score one forty. You know what I mean? If things if things work out his way, I mean, Sonia Dong. I mean, outside the let's even give him a first round knockout. His his I think his ceiling is probably one ten. You know um, where. Simone's is, is legit 140. So, um, yeah, I think Simone's probably the better play, but I'm probably going to end up yeah, probably with, with the same amount of both of them. But let, let's take a look, by the way, just to do an experiment. And then we'll review our, our top plays and stuff. 
what would we do? What would happen if we did put all these guys in? Can we? Can you play all three of these? I mean, eat. You could do it like literally easy, like if you want. And you could almost not quite, but you could almost also play Quinn. Can't quite do it, <laughs> but you do this. I mean, we can go over. I can't really build a lineup for you, but you you already know one of the free squares, and you know like one of the other underdogs and stuff. So you could play all three of these guys, gals, whatever, and and certainly be well within your rights. And you could even play, you know, you could almost play the main event also if you wanted. Um, I mean, you'd have to play if you did that. Then you would have to play uh, Sonya Dawn, I imagine. Um, yeah, now now we're stretching. Like if you play Sonya, if you play the main event, it's hard. But if you remember the other two underdogs that we talked about, uh, you can make this lineup really, really easy. Um, okay, so just to review, best play. Well, best play is Johnny News, is Journey News. Yeah. But uh, next best play is certainly uh, uh, Quinlan. Right? And then you would target those key fights, that being Arosa Padilla. That being, I guess, maybe Vieira Brundage, if you want to know the truth. Uh, main event. Uh, and was that it? As far as key fights? Oh, Padilla Rosa, did I mention that? So it would be Padilla Rosa, Brundage Vieira, main event as the key fights. And then those key, those key uh, other fighters I talked about. So hopefully, listen, I can't expect to repeat what we did last week. I can't imagine doing that for the next couple of years, but nonetheless, we're going to try. Um, and stay tuned for a betting breakdown where we have a little fun. And by the way, did we ever smash in the betting breakdown? That's crazy what we did there. We'll talk about that in that video. Uh, that'll do it. Good luck, everybody.